Hi, I'm Denver Holt of the Owl Research Institute in Charlotte, Montana. And uh, I guess I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about long eards today and great horned owls. And if I recall, I think this is our fourth year now of putting cameras up on nests. It's been very successful, actually. We've had um, young fledge every time uh, for both the great horns and the long eared owls. So it's it's been a good thing. We've learned quite a bit now uh, being able to particularly watch them at night and then watch them when no one else is around. Are you ready for your first question? Okay, I'm ready. There's a long-eared owl nest in an area where we all do the banding near the Institute uh, from the video on the ORI page. So maybe talk about where the nest is. Okay, so um, people are interested. Is the long-eared owl nest in one of our study areas? Is that what I, what I understand here? Uh, yeah, it is. It's actually, and uh, we will at some point go in and try to band uh, the female or recapture and the male or recapture and then band all the chicks. Uh, we like to give them as much of a break as possible, particularly during incubation and when the chicks are really young. Uh, but we also have to time it. So it, it's kind of, it's, it's a difficult thing to do sometimes. You want to be able to get data, but you don't want to disturb the nesting cycle. So what we've learned over the years is that if we can get those chicks right around when they're two weeks old and before they leave the nest at about three weeks of age, uh, then everything seems to work out pretty well. Do you know what happened to any of the chicks from last year's nest? Uh, last year's nest, uh, no, I, I don't know what the question was. Um, do we know what happened to any of the chicks? And I think five or six chicks fledged. And I don't believe we recaptured any of the young ones this year, at least so far. And so, and if we did, that would indicate what we would call uh, natal phylopatry, where young would come back to the, uh, to at least the area where they were born and maybe set up their own territories. We do have data on that, but not, not on last year's chicks. When and how can you tell if the owlets are male or female? When and how can you tell if the owlets, so I'm assuming the chicks of the nest are males or females. You know, we really can't do that uh, while they're nest bound. And it's probably pretty difficult right about up until fall. We believe that by fall, males and females will have the plumage differences that we've been able to recognize. But prior to that, I guess you'd probably have to do it by using DNA or maybe some measurement data. But I suspect DNA would be one of the best ways to do it at that point. What is the most interesting thing you've learned about owls in most your research? Interesting thing that I've learned about owls. So these are all of our eight or nine major projects, which we have going now. Um, I guess, first of all, I would say that we're full-time year-round owl researchers, and that's what we do for a living. So there's a lot of experiences here. I guess, um, how much I don't know. You know, I mean, personally, I've been doing it a long time, and the people who work for me have been doing it a long time. And now with the advent of like the cameras, for example, seeing what they do at night, and I think most owl studies, you know, you go in, you count eggs, and you measure chicks, and you capture and band adults and things like that. But the behavioral stuff is really something that we just don't know a heck of a lot about, particularly with the nocturnal species, which are most of the species of owls. So I'm learning more and more now that we have the capability with the cameras and infrared to see what goes on at night during their activity periods. When the chicks leave the nest at the end of the season, do they stay together for the winter or do they go off in different directions? Yeah, when the chicks leave, it's kind of interesting. We've tried to address that question uh, looking at communal roosts or family groups. And um, I would say right now what we have learned in, gosh, you know, 30 years this year, actually 30 years in this project with maybe 1,800 owls marked. And of that, who knows, five or 600 of them have been young of the year. What we've learned is when the chicks come to the fledging stage, uh, let's say it's seven weeks or so or something like that, um, once they're able to fly, they're still together up for a point of time. By now, the female has left. The male leaves shortly after the female. And then by fall, late summer, early fall, the chicks are on their own. They still hang together, what appears for a couple more weeks. And then after that, they seem to be on their own. And we've only twice now in 30 years, and all those numbers I just gave you, only twice have we ever found where two birds from the same family group or the same brood actually spent the winter in the same area together. Outside of that, they seem to just all go on their own. Okay, 
a lot of us witnessed the recent nest intruder incident. Can you talk a little bit about what we saw and whether the mom and the chicks are still in danger? Okay, the recent uh, drama at the nest site, uh, first of all, I have to ask, who was sitting up at 2 in the morning watching that and recording it? That's pretty cool. I don't know what you do for a living, but uh, I appreciated it. Um, I don't know the answer to that. You know, we've looked it over. Matt, my colleague, and I have looked it over quite a bit, as have a lot of you viewers. And I guess I don't know the answer. I've never seen anything like that. But then again, we've only had four years of cameras on nests at night. Uh, what it appeared, you know, as you've seen, it, that a long-eared owl came to the nest. Whether it was a male or a female, we don't know the answer to that. But interestingly, if you look at it again and listen, there's another long-eared owl in the distance, presumably a male, giving the typical hooting sound. And it had been doing that all night. We were watching earlier in the evening. We could hear in the distance that, which is presumably a male giving a, a courtship call, and I was wondering why he wasn't hunting. So anyway, this all came to the nest. It was really neat uh, drama going on there. A lot of really cool vocalizations. Whether it was a male or a female, whether it was predation event, whether it was perhaps another owl trying to usurp this female on the nest and take the nest over for his or her benefits, um, I don't know the answer. Uh, I really don't know the answer. We looked very closely, and we looked at the slow-mo information, we really couldn't tell if there was a chick that was taken from the nest. And then it sure seemed like, based on the vocalizations and what we know about the longer vocalizations, there was a lot of ruckus going on on the ground below that after she dove after the other owl on the ground. And then there's a wing that kind of slips through the camera, indicating maybe a third owl is involved in this. But uh, hard to know what's going on. What I can tell you is initially there were six eggs. And when we do check later on, Maybe we'll find six chicks, maybe we'll find four or five, but we may not be able to say with any certainty that one was taken from the nest. Sometimes they just die in the nest, not that often, though. So I don't know the answer to that, but it was really cool. Okay, next questions come from the third graders at Adisto Elementary in South Carolina. Cool. They've been observing the owls for a little over a week, and my first question is, who would win if an eagle and an owl fought? Okay, this is a third grade class from South Carolina. Hi, guys. Thanks a lot. Um, the question is, who would win if an eagle and an owl fought? Well, uh, I suppose that the eagle would if it was fighting a long-eared owl, which is what you're watching. And then, you know, the eagle's got a lot of size and a lot of body mass. And if it occurred, uh, maybe a bald eagle, for example, or a golden eagle, uh, would be able to subdue something the size of a great horned owl or a snowy owl. I don't think it occurs that often. Uh, perhaps an owl might have an advantage at night uh, because of its, you know, just its adaptation to the nocturnal environment and its vision. So maybe it would have some harassment advantages. But I would just think, you know, mass alone, size alone would give the eagle an advantage in any kind of, you know, skirmish or altercation. Okay. Uh, how many chicks are in the nest right now? When were they born, and how many chicks does one mother have per year? Okay, in this nest here, we, we know when we initially found it, there were six eggs, and we've left it alone since then because, like I say, we after we find them, we try to just give them a lot of, uh, a lot of time to themselves. It's really difficult. Some of the camera operators and viewers have indicated that there were, I believe, up to five chicks, four to five chicks. Uh, it's really hard, though, when you get a conglomeration of chicks in the nest. Sometimes the littlest ones are underneath the pile of the larger ones. So maybe there, there still are six, maybe there's not, but no more than six for sure. And what was the second part of that question again? Uh, when did they hatch, and how many uh, does one mother, you know, one female have per year? Okay, when th this nest here, I think the first ones hatch on the 31st and of March, if I, I'm correct there. And then they hatch sequentially after that, you know, one to two day intervals, you know, for the most part. Uh, in our study here now, over 30 years and who knows, 250 or so nests, um, the range has been three to seven, I believe. I'm just trying to recollect that. But mostly in our study here in Montana, it's, they, they lay about five, five eggs. And usually if the eggs hatch, they usually fledge uh, most of the chicks. Does she just have one nest a year? Uh, does she just have one nest a year was a, another part of that question. Um, as far as I know, I've never seen any indication of two broods per season. 
it's possible, I suppose, if during the early incubation period, if there's predation and nests and they lose the eggs, if it's early enough on that they may um, re-nest. Why are the chicks white and the mother a mixture of browns? Why are the chicks white and the mother a mixture of browns? That's a, that's a pretty cool question, actually. Um, what I think is going on, the eggs are also white. And there's a couple things going on. Maybe they haven't had to evolve camouflage coloration because one is it's it's nocturnal it's at night so um the female's on the nest throughout the night she's on the nest throughout the day um, only the female incubates and broods and so the eggs are primarily and the chicks primarily covered almost all of the time and when she does go out the nest it is at night as i said and so there's probably no need for camouflage coloration at that point and maybe there's some ener energetic constraints involved in that as far as i know uh, most of the owl species of the world and there's you know 250 plus species in the world they all have white eggs and again it probably has to do with again the females on the nest the whole time there's no share of incubation duty she doesn't have to go off for any reason except maybe to go to the bathroom or receive prey from the male and that usually occurs at night so that's probably the reason that there's no camouflage coloration both the eggs and the chicks however as they develop and when the chicks you know get a little older in their first week or so they do start to change color and they acquire another down plume which is what we call a mesotile or a second down and that down appears to have some camouflage coloration in all the species that i'm familiar with okay is this the same pair uh as 2015 is this the same pair as last year um we're not sure we've never had the same pair remate in successive years. Now, there's times when a male will return to an area showing site fidelity, but his female has always been different. And then there's lesser times, but where a female will return to the area and she's never had the same mate. So sometimes we'll see what we call site fidelity, mostly by males and occasionally females. In each of those cases where we've been able to recapture the birds, there's never been um a remating of the same individual so what appears to be happening in the long years it's you have seasonal monogamy but long-term polygyny so different mate each year we notice that both of these birds the female and the male are banded so we do have information on them we suspect this might be the same female that was there in 2015 because we did capture her earlier this winter and she was in at this site whether or not it's the same male would be the first time for us. I think the banding gives us a really, you know, a solid indication of um, the individuals. So, no. Uh, another repeat question here, but uh, average clutch size, how many eggs are generally laid? Okay, another question on how many eggs are generally laid. In here, I think it's been three to seven over our 30 years of doing this now, 200 and about 50 nests. But on average, it's right around five. Are owls different from other birds, and how are they different? Are owls different than other birds, and how are they different? Let me see what happened to the screen here. Okay, sorry, guys. Are owls different than other birds, and how are they different? Yeah, they're, they're different, but it's a tricky question. You know, I mean, they're different from eagles because of just, you know, how they've evolved. Um, they're different from parrots and just, you know, probably habitat influences the evolution of a lot of these you know species of birds mammals etc so they are definitely different um i don't know if i can go much further than that you know other than morphologically or characteristics of their dna characteristics of their physical attributes characteristics of their lifestyles probably influenced just by the habitats in which they occur in the nest at first uh, once again uh, similar question to before how many eggs were in this nest when we found the nest um, we had six eggs I, mean, I counted six eggs it's a very low nest actually you were actually able to look inside walk right up to the nest and look inside it so that that was kind of convenient for us when we do something like that you know you, again you try to be really careful with the birds your your, your major concern is them yet you do research at the same time and so in this case here, when we found the nest and we were checking on things, we flushed the female uh, and I was able to look in the nest. Then I back off. And what we normally try to do 
is to back off and then wait for the female to come back. So when we leave the area, we can say, okay, she's back on the nest. Uh, what's the lifespan of this type of owl? The lifespan, you know, it's really hard to get a good data set on that. I, I believe in North America, there might be some indication of in that 14 year range, I think in Europe, you know, 25 plus years. Uh, and that's wild birds, I believe. Captivity, you know, definitely would increase the, uh, the longevity. In our study area here now for over 30 years, we've had a couple of birds that we've captured that have made it to seven years or their eighth calendar year of life, but only very few of those. And it doesn't mean they died. It just might mean they've gone to different areas or we haven't been able to recapture them. Does the female uh, ever leave her nest? Does the female ever leave the nest? Generally, she goes off at night. And if you watch the camera here for the great horned and or the long-eared, if you watch the cameras, you'll see that, you know, there's a period after dark or right around dark or so when they'll get off the nest. And, you know, they, they have to go to the bathroom. They maybe go off and uh, cast a pellet, uh, stretch, preen, get food from the mail, uh, retrieve food that might be cached in a tree. So there are various reasons that they do get off the nest. And I assume that the owls probably know that if it's snowing or raining, you might want to be quick off and back on. If it's a nice warm day and there's nothing around, maybe you can stay off a little bit longer. But uh, certainly they come off the nest for reasons that are important to them. Another question about the attack or the defense thing. So do we know if uh, the attack on the nest the other night was another long-eared owl? And if it is, what could have prompted this and is this common? Okay, so back to the attack or the, the drama at the nest the other night. First of all, do we know if it was another long-eared owl? Yeah, it sure looked like another long-eared owl. Whether it was a male or female, I can't tell you that. Um, and we also know there was another one hooting in the distance. So you have at least three birds in the area. Um, have I ever seen anything like that? I think was the other part of that question. Uh, I haven't, no. But, you know, we're really just opening this whole world now of watching the birds uh, during their active periods, which is generally at night. So maybe we're going to learn a lot more. We've watched four, I think, long at all nests now with the cameras in four consecutive years. They've all done great. There's never been any abandonment. Uh, they've all adjusted the cameras pretty readily, and they've all fledged young. So... For those who want to stay up late at night, like whoever videoed it, uh, there's a lot to be learned now. And that's the thing about owls. You know, we know a lot about counting their eggs and, you know, visiting nests and visiting boxes and capturing adults and banding chicks. And those are those are nice anecdotes to their life history. But their nocturnal behaviors, for the most part, we just don't know a heck of a lot about. And now with the technology we have today, we're, we're going to be able to do that for the person that wants to sit there and either A, stay up and watch it, or B, perhaps take the footage and then break it down and then analyze it that way. It's going to be really cool if someone wants to do it. We've had some inquiries about that for students at, uh, for the master's level and PhD level who might want to do, use this for, you know, theses or dissertations. I think it's a great way to learn more about the birds. How do owls use their vision? And why do certain owls have different colored irises? Okay. Uh, let me go to the Second question on that first, why do owls have different color irises? There's basically three different colors in the world. There's yellow, brown, and then there's kind of like a orangey, reddish type of thing. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows the idea of that. And we had it broken down into percentages. You know, the highest percentage, and I don't know if it was in the 50 plus percentage or 60 or so, are yellow, followed by brown, followed by a very small percentage of the, you know, orangey, red type uh, of eye. I don't know, but what is interesting, if you look at that, is that it appears that most of the owl species with dark eyes uh, do occur in more tropical regions and are deep dark forests and are primarily nocturnal. Kind of interesting if you break it down like that. Um, exceptions do occur, however. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know why that is. And you know, if you look at a lot of bird species of the world, most of them, males, females, uh, um, individuals in the same genus and or the same families tend to have you know same colored eyes but uh, with these owls it's different and like in humans it's different so I can't tell you the barn owls all have brown eyes in the Titania family and the strigids the other group which are most of the species of owls rules have that three different eye calls and I don't know what it is yet but um, there's some interesting hints to it if you just look at nocturnal behavior now 
as far what was the other question there again? Let me go back. I got off track there. How do they use their vision? How do they use their vision? You know, again, it, it, it's it's probably real difficult to know. We know that they see primarily in black and white. But if you look at all the experiments that have been done, whether it's vision or hearing or other aspects of all biology and ecology and natural history, it's only been done on a few species. So we tend to like to extrapolate to the whole group. Um, how they use their vision, if you look at snowy owls, pygmy owls that are out in the daytime quite a bit, they, vision seems to be, in my opinion, a little more important to them. And then if you look at, at nocturnal species like long-eared owls and maybe flammulated owls and solid owls, hearing might be a little more important to them. So how they use it, I, I'm not sure again if I can answer exactly how they use it, but what we do know is that they see primarily in black and white, again, based on few studies, uh, they're able to bring in as much light as possible at night to project a brighter image on their retina, and that might help them to see. But hearing may be very important as well. So you have some owl species where hearing might be the primary means coupled with vision, and some owl species where vision might be the primary means coupled with hearing. Then if you look at that and you look at their activity periods, it's kind of interesting because you can see where the ones that we think are diurnal or hunting in the you know, low light levels, the crepuscular owls at dawn and dusk, they tend to have adaptations which um, which would indicate the vision is important. So they have reduced number of um, barbs on the leading edge of the feathers. They have reduced surface area of the barbules. They don't have the well-defined facial disc, maybe indicating that vision might be important. And then if you look at the ones that are strictly nocturnal, they may have you know asymmetrical ear positionings. They have an increased number of barbs on the leading edges of the feathers, an increased surface area of the barbules, indicating, again, that maybe hearing is more important in some species. So it kind of goes back and forth depending on on their activity periods and the habitats in which they occur. Hope that got to your answer. Do owls, for the most part, swallow their prey whole, except for tearing pieces off for the chicks? Uh, do, do owls, for the most part, swallow their prey whole? It just depends on the species and the size of the prey. If you look at something like, uh, again, we'll use a great horned owl, for example, and the male that you've seen here brings uh, voles back to the nest. And oh, very often the female will tear apart prey, as you just said, and feed little pieces to the chicks. However, uh, during the early part of the season, when the male brings it to the female during courtship, she may just gulp it down whole. And so you have something that weighs maybe an ounce or so, maybe a little bit more than an ounce. Um, but if that same great horned owl is being fed a duck or a coot or, or, or some big bird like that, then what it does primarily is it feeds and rips meat across from the breast and gulps down pieces of meat like that. How many species of owls in the world? How many species of owls in the world? You know, this seems to change all the time. Uh, the last definitive book on that was maybe 2008 or 9 or something, had about 250 species. And then, you know, it kind of goes up and down from there. So it might be safe, safe to say there's 250, maybe no more than 275, and maybe it's gone down, but it changes quite a bit. Okay, in all owl species, is it only the female that broods the eggs? In all owl species, is it only the female? As far as we know, and once again, you know, let's just say you've got that 250 plus or minus species in the world. Most of what we know is only from a handful of species. You know, we've got, you know, 19 species in the United States and Canada, roughly, let's say. And of those, only, only a few have been studied very well. So from what we know, it appears that only females incubate and, and brood the the chicks. Uh, males provide food protection. There's a lot of other things going on. We could find exceptions to the rule, but at least at this point in time, it, it appears that it's only females. This question says, Hi Denver, it's my dream to research owls. I would love to know how you got into the field and what advice you would give someone who is looking to get involved. Okay, it's someone who said hi to me. Uh, I like owls. What advice do you give to someone who wants to get in the field? How did it happen for me? Um, I guess I would say right away, I knew I wanted to be a field researcher, you know, I didn't want to get stuck behind a desk somewhere, and not to, you know, I don't want to, you know, be tough on my friends and colleagues and all that, but I could see the writing on the wall, if I was even fortunate enough to get a job in wildlife, you'd probably end up sitting behind a desk somewhere, maybe getting to go out once in a while. So I started the Owl Institute out of totally selfish reasons, because I wanted to be a field researcher and conduct long-term studies and 
and also do it for years on end. You know, I think that it's really important to have really long-term studies. Most studies are, you know, one to three seasons, and, you know, that's nice and all that, but um, in, in the end, we really want to know about how populations are doing, and in order to do that, you have to have really long-term data sets, and, you know, five years, ten years probably isn't even long enough. It's lifetimes on each of these species, so uh, I just set it up in order to be a field researcher, um, and now we have some of the, you know, lo longest um, long-term studies of several species of owls, certainly North America, but probably the world. Um, how do you do it? I think being entrepreneurial is really important. I think in today's world, uh, a person doesn't have to kind of settle for the traditional homes of research, which have you know, always tended to be federal, state, and university. A person now and we're seeing more and more of that, can go start their own research institute, conduct their own studies, and dedicate themselves to however you know, how much time they want to do it. I hope that got to your question. Uh, okay, there's, a, there's an image here with a female with something kind of yellow rough on her beak. And so any insights into this image? It looked like she consumed a yolk. She was clearly eating shell immediately before and after it occurred on the day of the first hatch. Okay, so I, I, I'm not seeing this, but Matt is relaying the message that someone has a has posted a photo where she's got something yellow on her bill, and um, clearly they saw her eat some eggshells. Yeah, and it, it, it's there is indication that some of the female owls may gulp down um, some of the yolk, or yolk sac, fecal waste and or eggs and some perhaps don't do it i know in the snowy owl nest we see a little bit of both that has happened there so i never saw this photograph but it, it certainly makes sense that it could have happened uh what species of owl is native to missouri what species of owl is native to missouri you know there's probably several species of owls that are native to missouri uh i don't know all of them i can tell you that more species of owls breed in the state of montana than any other state. 14 species breed here, and the snowy owl comes down in the winter. So I'm just guessing from Missouri, you've got to have you know, great horned owls, barn owls, screech owls, longer owls, shorter owls, uh, among several other species. Uh, so anyway, you could probably go just to the local bird list for the birds of Missouri, check with the Audubon societies or the equivalent of fish, wildlife, and parks or something like that there, and I'm sure they'll give you a, a species list, which is probably going to be seven or eight or more species. Okay, we don't see the male great horned owl bring food as frequently as the male long-eared owl does. Are they less involved than the long-eared owls? Um, you're not seeing the male great horn bring as much food as the male long-eared is the question in the comparison there. Are they not as involved? You know, I'm sure they're just as involved, but... I guess we'd have to look at the uh, at, at the images and find out how often maybe the female goes off the nest. So each time she goes off the nest, she may do a lot of things, as we talked about earlier, go to the bathroom, stretch, preen, etc. But she also may be receiving from the male then coming back with it. So I'm not sure of the rates, which is one of the neat things, again, about this uh, infrared at night and watch these owls at night, and someone could certainly do this, is you might be able to look at feeding rates and how often does a male great horned owl bring prey compared to a long-eared owl. And does it matter? If a long-eared owl brings or comes in more times with smaller prey and a great horn comes in fewer times with larger prey, does it balance out? Okay, sorry about that. I think we're back on. Um, let's see. How does a female eat while she's on the nest so long? Uh, how, does, how does a female eat while she's on the nest so long? Well, it, it, you know, it just depends. She certainly could eat on the nest or she may go off the nest and take time for herself. Uh, what we see in some of the species like snowy owls, for example, uh, where we're able to watch them throughout the 24 hour daylight period is that sometimes females will rip pieces off of the nest. She'll stand off to the side. Sometimes she'll fly away from the nest and just eat by herself. Maybe she just gets, you know, wants to get away from the chicks bothering her for food. So I'm sure these owls have that figured out. There's times when they want to be alone and eat, and there's times when they have to feed at the nest, and maybe there's times they have to feed chicks at the nest. There's a question uh, from people watching the cams on the long-eared owl about the male keeps bringing the female food items and it seems like she's refusing those okay common? yeah there's a question that uh uh one of our colleagues just you know relayed to me here that's been on the um on, on the the chat or whatever the facebook whatever it is you guys are doing um 
that very often the male long-eared will come into the nest and um, the female won't take prey. You know, I don't know what that's all about. You know, I mean, it's you're dealing with females, you guys. You know, I mean, it's very difficult. And so, uh, so who knows why? But I've seen it uh, again with our snowy owls. We're able to watch them from blinds all the time in in our video. I don't know what that's all about. Maybe she's just not hungry at that point in time. So maybe the male goes over and perhaps he eats it. Perhaps he caches it and tries to bring it back later. Um, Again, don't know the answer. Um, you know, everything that I tell you and everything that we have learned as a group is that we're making inferences on our observations. So what's really going on in the head of these species, only they know. Yeah, potential predators. Potential predators at the nest uh, is another question. Um, yeah, you know, uh, what we've seen over the years that occasionally uh, raccoons will climb up, and that's my biggest fear with this nest here. It is so low to the ground, and it is in kind of a wet area, and raccoons do frequent this area. So raccoons often climb in, not often, occasionally climb into nests. And what we've seen over the years is that sometimes the raccoons will just chew the chicks up, and, but they don't eat them, and maybe they're giving off a foul smell or an odor or a toxic chemical or something. But we've seen when they chew them up and they just don't eat them. Occasionally, eggs disappear. Uh, our female may abandon the nest, and then the magpies will get the will get the eggs. As you've seen in this video, the female owls are pretty good at fending off the magpies. You know, occasionally, one of these predators might get an egg or a chick. But for the most part, uh, the raccoon is my biggest concern. Sometimes a great horned owl could come to the nest if it discovered, and maybe you know kill a female and or take chicks from the nest. Uh, a couple years ago, we were working in an area where the chicks were out of the nest, but they still can't fly, and they, where they were out on the branches at about three weeks of age. They do that, and they get into the trees, but we caught a, uh, a cooper's hawk that had one of our banded chicks that had killed and had eaten. So there's definitely some predation on the long ears, probably much less so on the great horns. They're so big and formidable and aggressive that they can probably fend off most things. But the long ears, that's why they're so secretive and difficult to find, I suppose, is they, that they need to be able to hide to uh, reduce predation events. Um, do other owls prey on... On the chicks? Do the owls prey on the chicks? Yeah, I'm sure that happens. You know, just as I said here with the uh, great horned, I mean with the Cooper's hawk that had the chick, um, I'm sure that other owls like great horns would, you know, kill an adult long ear. We know that, and maybe take chicks from the nest. Uh, we have found in doing the pellet analysis over the years, looking at the pellets, which are the regurgitated remains of what's been eaten of the great horns, we do occasionally find uh, long and owl legs and even our bands. Um, in the in the pellets of the great horned owls as indication that at least it ate it. Whether it killed it or scavenged it is still unknown, but at least it, they did eat them. Uh, what did the chicks eat, and how did they get their water? What do the chicks eat, and how do they get their water? Uh, they eat whatever the females feed in them, which tends to be, you know, they're, they're carnivores, so they eat meat, and the female rips off little tiny pieces of meat in the beginning uh, with no bone content. And then as they get older, she'll feed them a little bit bigger pieces that may or may not have bone, and eventually it would be whole voles, for example. How do they get their water? You know, the chicks, I don't know. I imagine it's in the food that they consume where they're getting their moisture. The adults may go to um, areas where they can actually drink water and bathe and do things like that. Do the long ears and the great horns eat the same kind of give the same kind of prey to their chicks? What's the typical prey that they're giving? Do the long eared owls and the great horns uh, feed their chicks the same prey? You know, probably most of the time. The long eared owl is one of those specialists, like a short eared owl, etc., that feed primarily on small mammals. In our region, it's mostly voles, which are small hamster like little, little mammals that run around there. And when wolf populations are high, then everybody's eating voles. And both the great horn and the long ears do that. But when vole populations are low, the great horns are so big that they're capable of prey switching. So they may be able to take larger prey, such as rabbits, such as ducks, such as coots, whereas the long eared owl can't and tends to uh, move out of the area and migrate or move nomadically in search of areas where there's, you know, adequate numbers of small mammals for breeding and or survival. However, there's always a few long ears and always great horns in the area. So you might look at it from a competition standpoint. If they're eating the same things, are they competitive? Or maybe there's no competition. Maybe when there is so many bulls, everybody's happy and everybody's feeding on them.
Do all chicks do the same behavior as eagle chicks, which some refer to as bonking, where one sibling dominates the feedings and pecks and tries to prevent the younger chicks from getting food? Okay, do all chicks do the same thing as eagle chicks referred to as bonking? I've never heard that, but where a larger sibling might beat up uh, a smaller one or take food from it. You know, that remains to be seen now. Uh, we traditionally haven't been able to really watch them. Now that we have the technology, we're going to learn a little bit more about it. I can tell you again with snowy owls, where we have 25 years of research experience watching them from blinds and lots of uh, documentaries that we've done, that it appears that that doesn't really go on as has been stated in the past. And it appears that the chicks are actually, when they're young, are too weak to inflict any serious injury on each other. And females seem to apportion prey somewhat equally to the chicks, although larger ticks, chicks might outcompete the smaller ones. As far as the long ear goes and the great horns, now we're going to be able to see that and maybe just learn a little bit more about it. My, my guess is we're not going to see much of it, um, but, you know, it remains to be seen. What times do the chicks eat? What times do the chicks eat? Uh, I don't know. You're doing most of the watching the video, but it does seem to be. Um, well, I don't know. Hey, you know what? I, I, I think that we have seen sometimes where the female has fed them during the day. So that would be another really cool thing to do. Look at just feeding times as well as delivery times by the male. Because a female may pile up prey in the nest and feed as chicks give their food banking calls. Are there any plans in the scientific community to take DNA samples from all owl species and map their genomes and to see how they're interrelated? Yeah, are there any plans to, uh, to, to look at the DNA and the genomes and the taxonomy of owls by using molecular techniques? Yeah, and it, it has been done and it's continually evolving. Uh, there's a guy out of Germany who is probably one of the leaders in it is looking at taxonomy of owls in the world based on you know different types of genetic analysis and molecular analysis uh, DNA etc so it is being done it is being refined and it's a continuing effort and a continuing refinement but it's been really really interesting so far to see what they've done where you can now perhaps say uh, great horned owls for example in snowy owls uh, are more closely related than we previously thought are now placed in the same genus. Some people agree with that based on the DNA results. Some people disagree with that based on morphological stuff. So it's an evolving um, field right now, but it's 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 kind of neat actually. And uh, and yeah, we'll learn more and more as we go. This is one reason that the species of owls has increased from let's say the 1950s and 60s when perhaps there was 130 or 40 or 50 species of owls recognized in the world based on morphological information, now to perhaps 200 or 50 or so species of owls world based on morphology and our advances in molecular techniques. Do you have a favorite owl? Do I have a favorite owl? I get asked that all the time for the last 30 years or more. Uh, it's really hard to say. You know, I, I am... Definitely enamored with snowy owls, um, like most people. You know, owls are, as you probably know, are one of those popular groups of animals in the world. Then you take something in this great big white owl, and what it is about white animals, I, I can't tell you, but we seem to be very infatuated, myself included, with white owls such as a snowy owl, or white bears such as the polar bears, or white foxes such as the Arctic fox. So the snowy owl does have a special place in my heart. Just when I think that, however, I get back to where I started and with screech owls and long-eared owls and pygmy owls, which I find very fascinating. So I lean a little bit towards the great white owl, the snowy owl, but I'm fascinated with all the species and uh, and I learn so much. You know, it, it's a continuing, continuing thing, you know, just going out there learning and being fascinated. And I'm sure when I have experiences with more, you know, the perhaps tropical owls, a spectacled owl, for example, I would be just as fascinated with them. But, you know, I just have to get there. Have you ever seen a male pass prey to a female off the nest? Have I ever seen male pass prey to a female off the nest? I haven't seen it in the long years because most of it goes on, you know, in the nocturnal hours and away from the nest. Uh, but certainly I've seen it in snowy owls and great horned owls so um well we can watch them in, you know in the daylight and or the crepuscular hours so yeah it definitely occurs it may occur more than we know uh and probably does how big is the male 
which species? How big is a male? I'll just stay in both of them. You know, a, a male long-eared owl probably weighs, I can think about this now, I gotta do grams to pounds. Uh, it probably half a pound or three quarters of a pound. Females a little bit larger than males. And all the species where we have really good data, females tend to be larger than males. So, so you know, our, our male long-eared owls, if there's 450 plus grams to a pound and our males averaging the breeding season in that 260, 275 range, females are averaging that 420, 440 range. So you can do the math yourself. Both of them are less than a pound, females a little heavier than males. And the great horns, Males are probably in that two pound range, female two and a half, females in that three pound, three to four pound range. Um, how heavy are the chicks when they first hatch? How heavy are the chicks when they first hatch? You know, I know that data, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. We've done some growth rates with the long eared owls, and gosh, I, I, I want to say they were, they were in that 15, 20 gram range, so less than an ounce, let's say. And then the great horned owls are probably quite similar to the snowy owls, and that's probably going to be in that, you know, 40 to 50 gram range, so, you know, 30, you know, ounce and three quarters or so, a little less than two ounces. Uh, let's see, another, uh, what preys on owls? How can they have a low to the ground nest without a predator on the ground coming in for lunch? What preys on owls? Uh, lots of things prey on owls, the first part of that. Uh, larger owls can prey on smaller owls, larger hawks can prey on smaller owls. Uh, larger eagles might prey on smaller or medium-sized owls, and then there's mammals, and you know the follow-up to that was, and how can they nest so low to the ground if there's predators? Yeah, that's why you got to be sneaky and camouflaged and quiet and use a variety of things to enhance your crypticity or your camouflage, such as the patterning of a long at all, the colors and natural colors. Um, the behaviors, so they bring that all together in conspicuous locations, in conspicuous nests, the evolution of these, you know, natural colors, these browns and tans and blacks to render them inconspicuous, the pattern of the plumage, and the, excuse me, and then finally behaviors to render them inconspicuous in hope that the threat passes. Uh, how, how close will another nest be? How close will another nest be? In the great horn owls, it's funny you ask that because uh, last week we were out doing some nest searches. We found uh, a great horn owl, two nests that were, oh, you know, maybe only, let's say, 500 yards apart or so, um, where normally we always think they're about a mile apart. Uh, and with the long eared owls, uh, I think there was a guy in Idaho who had them you know, very close together, you know, 20 meters or something like that, or let's say 20 yards, just make that 20, 25 yards. For us, it's usually a couple hundred yards most of the time, with occasional exceptions to that. Are there any threats or concerns for either of these species? Threats or concerns for either of these species. With the great horned owls, uh, I, I would say probably not. They seem to be very adaptable, uh, particularly around human habitation. Here we live in western Montana, every almost every farm that has a bunch of trees has a great horned owl uh, pair that resides there. Uh, so they seem to be doing okay. I'm not sure about nationally, but I, I, I imagine they're doing okay. The long-eared owls, there does appear to be a decline, uh, which fits with all the open country species of owls, like the shorted owl and the barn owl and the long-eared owl. The trend in our study here in western Montana is definitely downward for the long-eared owls. And again, that follows suit with other open country species of owls. Let's see. That follows suit with other open country species of owls like shorted owls and barn owls. So uh, reasons for that are unknown, and we need to just get a better handle on it. Uh, it's going to be difficult for species like long eared owls, which are you know almost strictly nocturnal. Uh, that's why you have to go out and do surveys, and you can't just do surveys for one season. Because of the nomadic or highly migratory nature of something like a long-eared or short-eared, you could go do a survey one year and say, yeah, they're all over the place, but that's just related to the food resources. Next year, they could be gone. So that's why multiple surveys, multiple years, simultaneously conducted throughout a wide geographic range. But my guess is the longer dollars are being overlooked, and they're probably going down uh, throughout their range. How long will you continue to, to research longer dolls? How long will I continue to research longer dolls? Well, let's see. I just wrecked my knee the other day doing boreal owl stuff, so that put me down for a couple of days. 
uh, just as long as I can do it. You know, I can't run as fast as as the students and the younger researchers that work with us anymore, but I can still climb trees just as good as them. Uh, I'll just keep doing it. You know, this isn't one of those jobs where I'm looking forward to retirement. I, I do have a lot of writing to do, you know, some books and th monographs and things like that. Uh, but I hate to come out of the field. Uh, I'm still learning. And uh, I imagine, you know, I'll, I'll do it a good 20 more years, as long as I can climb, you know, and uh, and chase stuff around. And maybe at that point, I'll just order, you know, students and subordinates up the trees and things of that sort and through the marshes. But uh, I'll just do it forever until I die. Will, you, will we put a snowy owl camera up again this year? Yes. Uh, question is snowy owl camera. We are poised to go up there at the end of May and start looking for snow owls. Hopefully the lemming populations are high enough that we'll have a good number of snow owls, if any, breeding. And this year, uh, we learned a lot the first year on that. Uh, this year we're going to try to put up another snowy owl cam. And um, and again, hopefully, hopefully the owls will cooperate, the weather will cooperate, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get to learn about a really cool ground nesting owl, the Arctic tundra, uh, whose numbers are also declining for reasons unknown. So, yeah, we're going to give it another try. And the thing to remember with these owls, though, is, you know, you don't have a long window. You know, once we get the female incubated, and as soon as those chicks hatch, because they're ground nesters, they're going to be out of there as soon as possible. So we only have about three weeks uh, before they'll start wandering the tundra on foot. 